Welcome back to our fourth and final talk on this series in uh, Second Peter. Uh, this talk is called, surprisingly, Ethics by Eschatology. It's what we've been building up to uh, through these first three talks. Uh, I'm going to read Second uh, Peter chapter 3 and verse 11 to 18. So please have your Bibles open with me. But before we come to the reading and preaching of God's Word, let's pray. Father, in your light we see light, and so we pray that you would come now and by your Holy Spirit illuminate the reading and the preaching of your Word so that we might see Christ more clearly, love him more dearly, and follow him more nearly. And we ask this in his name, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever praised. Amen. So Second Peter, chapter 3 and verse 11. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found in him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God endures forever. We all live in the present in light of the future. We all live in the present in light of the future. If you have a court case coming up for speeding, uh, then in the meantime, you slow down. You keep the speed limit. You don't jump the traffic lights. Uh, as Christmas looms on the horizon, we buy cards and presents and wrapping paper uh, all about at six o'clock on Christmas Eve. Uh, we all live in the present in light of the future, but not just the, in the practicalities of everyday life. We do it in the practices of religious life. Uh, if you're a Hindu who believes that after death there is a cycle of reincarnation, then you work on your karma in this life to make sure that you get reincarnated into a higher state of being in your next life. If you're a Muslim, who believes that after death and at the final judgment there is paradise to be gained for faithful believers and a hell to be shunned for sinful unbelievers, then you practice the five pillars of Islam. You confess Allah to be the true God. You pray, you give to the needy, you fast during the month of Ramadan, and you make a pilgrimage to Mecca. And if you're a Muslim who believes there is a great reward in the afterlife for those who perform jihad, then you get in a truck and drive down a promenade in France, mowing people down as you go, knowing that in the end, you will lose your own life, but receive your great reward. Whatever religion we are, we all live life in the present, in light of the future. What we do today is shaped about what we believe about tomorrow. Humanists and atheists are not exempt. They believe that when they die, they're done. And so they eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow they die, and then they're done. They try to get as much pleasure out of this life because there is nothing beyond this life. 
There is no afterlife. They live in the present in light of the future. It's ethics by eschatology. It's a Christian concept, but it applies to everyone because this world is God's world. We all have an eschatology. We are all orientated towards the future. We all have an ethic. And for all of us, our eschatology drives our ethic. And that's why Peter wrote this letter, so that we might have a certain eschatology and, there, and then a godly ethic, a certain eschatology and a godly ethic. The false teachers and skeptics have a skeptical eschatology, which produces a sinful ethic. They believe there's no coming judgment, and so they live lives as they please, following their own sinful desires. We see that in verse 3 of chapter 3. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. Uh, why do they follow their own sinful desires? Because, verse 4, they have a skeptical eschatology. Where is the promise of His coming in judgment? But God wants us to have a certain eschatology which produces a godly ethic, uh, which brings us to these final verses where we see the motto of Second Peter come to the fore. Ethics by eschatology. Living now in light of then. Living in the present in light of the future. Living with the end in mind. And Peter shows us this in four ways. Number one, in light of the coming judgment, live holy and godly lives. In light of the coming judgment, live holy and godly lives. Verses 11 to 12. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. Peter is simply repeating what he said in verse 10. God's coming judgment with fire will dissolve everything above us, the sky, the sun, the moon, the stars, in order to expose everything around us, all the works done on the earth. What awaits this world in God's coming judgment, if you remember from the last talk, is not annihilation. It's revelation. It's full exposure, full disclosure of everything done on the earth, followed by the appropriate punishment. And Peter says, if that's what lies in the future, how then should you live in the present? Verse 11, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? The word holy in verse 11 means set apart, and it is used of God in Peter's first epistle, where Peter quotes Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2, be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Uh, the word godly here means morally upright, which reflects God's character. So Peter is really calling us to live God-like lives. In the light of the coming judgment on the ungodly, live God-like lives. Live different lives. Live distinct lives. That's the point here. Distinctly different lives. People who know us, who aren't Christians, should be looking at our lives and saying, twinkle, twinkle little star, how I wonder what you are. You're godlike. You're different to us. You're distinct from us. And why are we to live distinctly different lives? Well, because it's what you do when there's a coming fire. Uh, remember, I mentioned the worst fires in Australia's history in the state of Victoria in February 2009. Uh, the worst day in that uh, terrible uh, episode of bushfires was called Black Saturday. Uh, now just think about what the people in those fire zones in Victoria did on Black Saturday when they saw those fires coming at them. They lived totally different lives compared to everyone else in Australia that day. People in Perth were driving along on the road listening to music. 
People in Adelaide were heading out to work. People in Sydney were getting ready for a lunchtime barbie or sitting on the deck uh, to relax. People all over Australia were going about their normal lives, but not the people in the state of Victoria. Why? Because they were fleeing their homes because a fire was coming. That day, the people in the fire zone were living distinctly different lives compared to ordinary Australians all over the country. Why? Because they saw the fires coming. And that's what Peter says we are to be like. A fire is coming, not just to a region of this world, but to the whole world. A fire is coming. It's going to dissolve everything above us in order to expose everything around us. There's going to be full exposure, full disclosure, followed by a judgment. And Peter says, in light of that coming judgment, live holy and godly lives. We wouldn't invest in a company that we know is about to crash next week. Uh, we would invest in behavior. So, sorry, so why would we invest in behavior that we know is heading for God's damnation? It would be like those in the fire zone in Victoria remortgaging their houses at the bank on the morning of Black Saturday, even though they knew what was coming. It would be total madness. But we can act like that as Christians sometimes when we slip back into bad behaviors, old behaviors, when we participate in the ways of the world, when those ways of the world are heading for God's judgment. And Peter says to us, in light of the coming judgment, live holy and godly lives. And when we do, he says, we will speed the day of God's coming. We will speed the day of the coming day of God. Now, some people think this means that there is no fixed date for the coming judgment and we can speed it up ourselves by being holy. Uh, I don't think that's what uh, this verse means. Uh, I don't think that view can be reconciled with Jesus saying that the Father knows the day and the hour of His return. Uh, so we can't change the objective date in God's mind. It's fixed. But we can change the subjective weight in our mind. It's fluid. Subjectively, the day of the Lord uh, will feel faster if we are more holy and more godly. Uh, you've heard the saying, time flies when you're having fun. Well, time flies when you're being godly. Time flies when you're being holy. The holier we are, the quicker this day will come from our subjective experience. So that's what Peter's first exhortation is to us. In light of the coming judgment, live holy and godly lives. Second, in light of the coming renewal, live pure and at peace lives. Verses 13 to 14. In light of the coming renewal, live pure and at peace lives. Uh, verse 13 and 14. But according to His promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Do you see the ethics by eschatology again? Uh, we are waiting for the new heavens and the new earth. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for this eschatological reality, Here's the ethics. Be diligent to be found without spot or blemish and at peace. So in light of the coming renewal, live pure and at peace lives. Now, why do I say in light of the coming renewal? Doesn't Peter say in, coming, in light of the coming new creation, the new heavens and the new earth, not renewed heavens and renewed earth? Well, let me take you back to the bushfires in Victoria. Uh, the fires in Victoria burned everything in sight, grass, trees, animals, homes, everything. But the land of Victoria was not dissolved into a soup of quarks and of leptons. Uh, the earth in the state of Victoria was completely exposed, but it was not dissolved. And after the tr fires were put out and the weeks and months passed, new grass and new trees started to grow. 
Animals started to come back into the area and inhabit it again. New homes were built. Towns became populated again. Everything was new. But was it unrecognizably new? No, there was continuity with the past. There was grass, trees, animals, homes, towns. The fires destroyed everything. But after the fires came renewal. And that is what will happen to the heavens and the earth. The fire of God's judgment will destroy and expose everything, but afterwards there will be a renewal. This is why the flood in Peter's Old Testament analogy for the end time judgment is used. Um, Because the flood, remember, was a decreation, recreation event for the earth. Uh, The earth was destroyed by water, but it wasn't washed away. Uh, The earth didn't get washed down the plug hole of the universe. After the waters subsided, a new earth was formed, but it was still the same earth. Same then with the end time judgment by fire. The fire will destroy like the waters of the flood destroyed, but the fire will not annihilate the earth. It will renew the earth. A couple of things help us to see this. The the fact that the heavens and earth will be replaced by another heaven. Uh, heavens and another earth shows us that there must be some kind of continuity going on here. Uh, The word new helps us as well. In Greek, there are two words for new. Uh, The one refers to newness in time and in origin. Uh, The other refers to newness in nature and quality. Peter uses the latter word here. In other words, this is a heavens and an earth of a new nature, a new quality, but not a new origin or a new time. So there is continuity between the first creation and this new creation. And the first creation is relatively, uh, sorry, renewed qualitatively in an entirely new creation, one that is unable to be corrupted. It's what Paul says in Romans 8, 21, The creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So what awaits us is a renewed heavens and earth. I think uh, thinking about Jesus here uh, can help us as well. He's called the first fruit of the new creation. Uh, Think about his pre-resurrection body and his post-resurrection body. Post-resurrection, he appears in a room with doors closed, right? He clearly has a new kind of body that can just come into a room without opening the door, okay? He can just appear and disappear. Uh, And yet, in the room, he says to Thomas, look at my scars in my hands and my side. Touch them if you want. So, it's a new body, and yet it's actually his old body as well. There's continuity here. There's discontinuity in that it is now an incorruptible, imperishable, glorified body that he has. And yet it's still the same body. He's got the scars from his crucifixion on it. There's newness, yet continuity as well. Well, so too with the new creation. Jesus is the first fruit of the new creation. And so Uh, The new creation will be like this as well. It will be new, but it will be continuous with the old creation, which means it's going to be real and physical. Uh, But do we know anything else about it? Is it just going to be real and physical? Is that all? Well, no. Uh, Peter tells us um, that it is going to be a place in in which righteousness dwells. Uh, One of my favorite authors, uh, C.S. Lewis, Uh, a fellow Ulster man, uh, once said that heaven uh, is Oxford lifted up and placed in County Down, Northern Ireland. Heaven is Oxford lifted up and placed in County Down, Northern Ireland. Well, I'm from County Down, Northern Ireland, and uh, C.S. Lewis was a genius. Uh, But like all geniuses, he did have his blind spots. He got the right county, uh, but the wrong city. Uh, He should have said Cambridge. Uh, But I'll forgive him that. But notice what he was doing. He was saying that heaven is not just a beautiful place like County Down, Northern Ireland. For Lewis, heaven 
is a beautiful place because it is an inhabited place. When he spoke about Oxford being lifted up and placed in County Down, he was speaking of Oxford, the university city, with its students and professors and town folk and libraries and culture. Lewis was saying that heaven is about the people as well as the place. And for Peter, it is no different. The new heavens and the new earth will be worth waiting for because of the place, yes, but also because of the people. And Peter states that people will be there, but in a rather surprising way, verse 13. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. It's a beautiful picture of righteousness personified. Righteousness if you like, kicking back in the living room and putting its feet up. There will be a home for righteousness. Now, I don't think Peter is thinking here of God, of Christ's imputed righteousness floating through the atmosphere of the new heavens and the new earth. I think he's speaking about embodied righteousness, human righteousness, the righteousness of men and women and boys and girls running the streets of the new heavens and the new earth, justified in Jesus, living righteous lives. Righteousness here refers to doing God's will, which is what human beings are called to do, but what we fail to do in this heavens and earth. But in the new heavens and the new earth, righteousness seen in the lives of men and women, boys and girls, will be right at home. And it will be at home because a righteous moral person called Jesus is the first fruit of this new creation. He is the one who did God's will perfectly on earth as it is in heaven. And when we get there, we will do God's will perfectly on a new earth as it is in a new heaven because we will be like him through our union with him. The new creation is the home of embodied righteousness, of human righteousness. And that's why Peter calls us to embody righteousness now, verse 14. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these things, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blame and at peace. In other words, if the coming new creation is home to righteousness, and that's where we are going to live, then we need to start looking like we belong there. We, we need to start living now like we will live there then. It's a bit like when you go on a sun holiday, say, to Thailand or somewhere like that, where the temperature is hot and the water is inviting you. Prepare to look uh, like you belong there. You get some new swimmers, you buy a new pair of sunglasses, you get a summer shirt, you get the right kind of sandals or flip-flops or thongs, I think, as you call them here. Uh, why do you do that? Because when you get there, you want to look like you belong there. And if you are heading for a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells, then you need to get ready to look like you belong there. You need to get ready to live now like you will live then. That's Peter's exhortation. Uh, since you're waiting for these things, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Uh, the word uh, found here, it's the same word as laid bare in verse 10, or exposed rather in verse 10. Uh, it connects to this idea of full exposure, full disclosure. It's not just the ungodly lives who uh, that will be exposed or disclosed. Our lives will be exposed and disclosed on that final day. And so Peter exhorts us to be found like we belong somewhere else. And he mentions two things. He says, first of all, be found, be exposed, be found to be spotless and blameless. And second, be found to be at peace. Uh, the phrase spotless and blameless recalls the Old Testament sacrifices, which had to be without spot or blemish. Uh, in the first epistle, uh, Peter uh, describes Jesus as a lamb without spot or blemish. 
Uh, and now here, Peter in his second epistle is picking up this language and applying it to us Christians, which makes sense if we're united to Christ. It's a picture of a pure sacrifice. It's a picture of Christ-likeness. Christians are to be God-like, verse 11, as we saw, uh, holy and godly, and we are to be Christ-like, verse 14, spotless and without blemish. And God-like and Christ-like are really the same thing when you think about who Christ is. He is God. Uh, we're also to be found at peace. Uh, this does not refer to being at peace in ourselves uh, or with others, uh, but being found at peace with God. It's a vertical peace, not a horizontal peace. Uh, when Jesus returns, Peter encourages us to be found as friends with God, not as enemies. If I can go back to the illustration about the holiday vacation in Thailand, uh, before you prepare to look like you belong there with the sunglasses and the, and, and the swimmers and the shirt and the sandals, uh, you need to get a visa to allow you to go there. You need the visa because you're not from there. And when it comes to the new creation, we're not from there. And so we need a visa to get there. And the only visa that works is the one that says, at peace with God and is stamped in the king's own blood, in the blood of his own son. But notice what Peter says in verse 14. The new heavens and the new earth are not just for people who are at peace with God, but who are also spotless and blameless. In other words, we're not just to be found justified before God, at peace with God. We are to be found sanctified, spotless and blameless. In other words, what we have here is justification and sanctification. They are distinct but inseparable uh, because when Christ saves a person, He simultaneously justifies them and begins sanctifying them positionally and progressively. It's a bit like when you stand in the sun, you receive two things at once. Uh, you receive light and heat. You can't stand in the sun and not receive both. Uh, when you are in the sun, S-O-N, you cannot but receive justification and sanctification from Him. Uh, Jesus died for sin. That's our justification. Uh, he also died to sin, Romans 6.10. That's our sanctification. When Jesus saves us, we receive both from Him. We receive the at-peace status before God, and we receive a, progress, a positional and progressive, spotless and without blemish, progressive growth in holiness. It's a bit like the thief on the cross uh, when he put his trust in Jesus. He had his sins washed away, but he also had his mouth washed out as well. And Jesus did both for him simultaneously. When he put his trust in Christ, he was united to Christ in that very moment, and he had his sins washed away, and he also had his mouth cleaned out. So we only get into the new heavens and the new earth if we are at peace with God through Christ and being sanctified in Christ, uh, being made spotless and without blemish. And that's why Peter says what he says in verse 14. It's why in verse 15 he says what he says, where he says it, because while we wait for the new heavens and the new earth, we need to consider God's patience, which brings us to the third point. In light of the coming judgment, live holy and godly lives. In light of the uh, coming renewal, live pure and at peace lives. And third, in light of waiting for these things, consider God's patience as salvation. Consider God's patience as salvation. Verse 15 and 16. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. Uh, just like with any travel, you can get your visa, you can book your flights, uh, you can buy your swimmers and sunglasses and shirt and sandals, uh, but there's always a wait. We look forward to it, but we have to wait for the holiday. Same with the new creation for us Christians. We are to look forward to it, but we also have to wait for it. Uh, Peter emphasizes this looking forward 
uh, waiting period three times in verses 11 to 14. Uh, in verse 12, he tells us that we are waiting for the coming judgment, looking forward to it. Um, verse 13 to 14, he says it again, uh, waiting, verse 13, for the new heavens and the earth. Verse 14, waiting for these things. Um, so three times Peter emphasizes this idea of waiting. But who of us likes to wait for anything, especially when it's something exciting that you're going to do? And yet Paul, uh, Peter, sorry, tells us that in light of waiting for these things, consider God's patience as salvation. It uh, reminds me of the story that Don Carson uh, tells of a seminary student at his seminary uh, in Chicago at Trinity Evangelical uh, School of Divinity. In 1979, uh, this student was being considered for a post uh, in a church after seminary. And the church wanted to fly the student and his wife out for an extended weekend to get to know them, interview them. Uh, the only problem was the interview fell on the uh, the same week as his uh, final exams. Uh, and instead of telling the church he couldn't make the date, and instead of asking the dean of students could he have permission to go, he just went ahead and uh, booked the flights and then asked for permission afterwards. Well, the permission wasn't granted. And so he kicked up a stink. All his students kicked up a big fuss uh, about why was a seminary being so strict on final exams? Could he not just go and be interviewed by the church and come back and do the exam another time? Well, the seminary stood their ground and the students had to sit his exams on the day of the week that it was scheduled. Uh, and during the exam, at the time he was sitting the exam, the plane he was supposed to be on uh, took off from Chicago O'Hare uh, Airport, rose 400 foot into the air, lost an engine, rolled and crashed, killing all 277 people. Sometimes waiting is a positive thing. Sometimes waiting can save your life. And it's the same with us. We wait for the return of Christ longer than we might hope, but we wait for it. The, the wait for it is for our salvation. Our waiting is God's patience. And God's patience uh, is our salvation, as Peter says, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation. In light of waiting for the coming judgment and the coming renewal, consider God's patience as salvation. It is a time to put to death the sins in our lives and be ready to be found, to be exposed on that final day, at peace with God, justified in Christ, and being sanctified in Christ, being spotless and without blemish. Consider God's patience as salvation. This is Peter's third point. And then finally, uh, we come to his uh, fourth point, in light of Bible twisters, guard and grow. In light of Bible twisters, guard and grow. We've seen, in light of the coming judgment, live holy and godly lives. In light of the coming renewal, live pure and at peace lives. Uh, in light of uh, waiting for these things, consider God's patience as salvation. And then finally, in light of Bible twisters, Guard and grow, verse 16 to 18. Middle of verse 16, there are some things in Paul's letters that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Paul saw the connection between eschatology and ethics, just like Peter did. It's there in all his letters. And so Peter brings Paul into the discussion here uh, in order to give a unified apostolic witness to the matters that Peter is addressing. It's kind of a strength in numbers argument to his ethics by eschatology argument. But the false teachers like to take what Paul has said and twist the hard bits. 
in order to deny Christ's return and in order to promote their ungodly lifestyle. And they do it to their own destruction. But if we begin to believe them or become like them, then we ourselves will fall from our stable position. If we begin to develop a skeptical eschatology, then we will begin to have a sinful ethic. And so Peter calls us to be on guard against such people. Uh, we just need to think about the pressure, for example, on the Christian church at the moment to endorse and legitimize same-sex attraction, same-sex marriage. Uh, false teachers in the church are promoting a lifestyle contrary to God's Word, and they're doing so because they have become embarrassed about the Bible's eschatology, about the fact that God is coming again in judgment at the return of Jesus Christ to judge these ungodly lifestyles. We've become embarrassed about that, and so the church is now compromising our ethic because we've become embarrassed about our eschatology. We've become embarrassed about doctrines like creation and the flood, that's why we no longer believe uh, as clearly in the coming judgment by fire. And second, Peter teaches us that if we're going to get our ethics right, then we need to get our eschatology right. And if we're going to get our eschatology right, then we need to get our history right. And if we're going to get our history right, then we need to believe in God's divine intervention in creation and the flood. See, it's all connected. You can't believe the Bible piecemeal. You can't pickpocket this bit and that bit. Uh, out of the Bible. Uh, but if we're embarrassed about our history, then we will be embarrassed about our eschatology. And if we're embarrassed about our eschatology, we're going to get embarrassed about our ethics. And once we become embarrassed about our ethics, then it's only a matter of time before we abandon our ethics and join the world in their ungodliness. And once we do that, then the only thing that awaits us is God's coming judgment with fire. And that's why we are to be on our guard against people who would lead us into such error. So, that's Peter's first point of his final point here. Be on guard against uh, false teachers. Verse 17, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. Be on guard. But he tells us to do something else. Verse 18, uh, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, isn't that verb surprising? Grow. He's just talked about falling away from our secure position. So we'd expect him to use a standing verb here, you know, be on guard that you don't fall, but stand firm or something like that. But instead, Peter says, grow. Uh, when Jackie and I lived in uh, Cambridge, one of the things we love, uh, loved and still love about Cambridge is uh, it's a cycling city. And uh, cycling is a, a great joy in Cambridge. You can cycle by the River Cam. You can uh, cycle through this uh, magnificent city with all the historic buildings. Uh, but it's actually also a very dangerous thing to do. Uh, you need to be on the lookout uh, because you can easily get knocked off your bike, most often by tourists from other parts of the world who uh, don't really understand uh, the etiquette uh, for crossing a road with lots of cyclists. And uh, so you can easily get knocked off your bike by cars, by tourists. But there's something else that can cause you to fall off your bike, and that is just becoming static like in traffic or at a traffic light. If you stop moving forward, you fall off your bike. The most stable way to ride a bike is to keep moving while you stay on guard for the things around you that could knock you off. And that's like the Christian life. The best way to stay stable is to stay on the move, to keep growing. That's what Peter is saying here. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The grace here is grace that we have received from the Lord Jesus in saving us. Uh, we are to grow in our experience of His grace in our lives. Uh, the knowledge here is the knowledge that Jesus gives us about Himself, um, which would include the knowledge of the Bible, which feeds our knowledge of Him, as well as the knowledge that helps to discern uh, what the teaching of skeptics and false teachers are. 
So we're to grow in these two gifts from Christ, the gift of God's grace in our lives and the gift of the knowledge of Christ. Uh, When we grow in these things, we stay stable. Uh, So that's what we are to do in light of Bible twisters. Uh, We are to guard and we are to grow. Well, in closing, let me uh, return to where we began these talks on 2 Peter with our motto, Ethics by Eschatology. That's 2 Peter in a nutshell. Ethics by Eschatology. Living now in light of then. Living in the present in light of the future. Living with the end in mind. However, verse 18 shows us there's something missing from our motto. Uh, To him... Be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Verse 18 is is like a big umbrella heading that covers everything in the book. Every ethical imperative in 2 Peter comes under the banner of this second part of verse 18. To him be the glory both now and forever. Uh, Amen. That's why it's placed at the end of the book to encompass the whole book. So the motto of Second Peter, which I hope you'll never forget, ethics by eschatology, needs three more words. Ethics by eschatology, soli deo gloria. Ethics by eschatology for the glory of God alone, or perhaps we could say soli Christo gloria, for Christ's glory alone. It's about living now in light of then for the glory of Christ now and for all eternity. Amen and amen. Let us pray. Father, what we know not, please teach us. What we have not, please give us. And what we are not, Please make us for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever praised, world without end. Amen.